happened after the 2006 transatlantic terror plot was uh, broken up over in England. Um, the Transportation Security Administration imposed the 311 rule as a uh, carefully thought out risk mitigation concept of operations or con ops so the American public could travel safely. Um, but that's, that's interfered with the convenience of the public. It slowed down commerce a little bit, and it hasn't really given us the full measure of security that we would like to achieve. The prototype that we see here today will offer great promise for efficiently discriminating threat materials and liquids, and the design seems amenable to commercial adoption. The innovation that you'll see here comes from the contributions of many people, and it began in the early days as a partnership between DHS and Los Alamos National Labs, leveraging NIH investments in low field brain imaging techniques. And we saw a promising approach for being able to discriminate liquids at the molecular level. Just as in an MRI machine, information is provided about the difference between fat and muscle or benign tissue and a cancerous tissue, we're able to make classifications about liquids, whether they're threat li liquids or benign liquids that are okay for people to take on. You'll see two devices. One device is a little bit larger. Uh, it's a direct descendant of the larger MAGVIS instrument that we brought down. Uh, it has the same sensor technology, which is called a superconducting quantum interference device, or SQUID. So if you hear us talking about the SQUIDs, we don't have marine life trapped in the instrument. They're, they're detectors. That drives the size. It drives the complexity of the instrument. But the SQUID remains the world's most sensitive magnetic field detector. Uh, the second unit that you'll see up there is smaller. It's more compact doesn't use a squid, runs at room temperature, um, and so we're really pushing hard towards getting as much signal as we can with uh, the most mainstream and easily deployable equipment that we can find. What um, the device is doing right now, what it's doing during the 15 seconds, is applying a magnetic field, not a large field, um, aligning some magnetization inside of the, the sample, and then manipulating that magnetization and looking how it evolves over the scan time. How that evolves is characteristic of the material that's inside. In the case of this can, it's one of those fake cans I showed you, and it's actually filled with acetone. So it's not, it's not 7-Up. We've taken a step towards a more compact and uh, smaller scale unit that could be put at the checkpoint as a secondary screener. And that's technology that could be more rapidly deployed to the airport. This is a secondary screening tool, so I don't know, depending on how they deploy it, if it would speed up the line. But what it does do is there are people who show up at the checkpoint every day with legitimate reasons why they need to exceed the 311 rule, a medical condition that requires a liquid medicine, um, infant formula, you know, things they want to carry on board the aircraft that are, you know, legitimate things that need to be greater than the three ounce restriction. And right now, screeners don't have great tools for making sure that those things can go on board. And it would go a long way towards easing the, the you know, the discomfort in the passengers of having to discard perfectly good items at the checkpoint to be able to to have this tool. The next step that we would really like to see is a real commercialization of this technology so that it can get out to the public. And I think at the same time, as I said, taking the lessons that we learned from this and, and translating them back to our efforts in, in brain imaging, because just as this technology is really good for portable MR, for an airport, I think it would make a real difference in portable MR for emergency rooms, for battlefields, for, for people who can't get high field MRIs.